I see the gathering as something that doesn't have to be in person per se. Uh, spiritual gathering is, is enough for me, but mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. He believes it. He has the right to do it. Bingo. You know, for what it's worth, uh, you know, I, I, I see it, you know, the same way. But when it comes to the First Amendment, the law really doesn't care one way or another which point is theologically correct. Right. What it, it tries to do is it, and it tries to, yeah, it tries to maximize individual liberty. And, and, and this is one area where I think um, even as badly as the court has the Supreme Court has messed up the free exercise clause. This is one thing where it's gotten it right, has been in cases where there have been, you know, um, beliefs that have come up that, you know, may be considered unorthodox, even within a particular person's denomination. The court has done a pretty good job of holding the line and saying, mm -hmm. um, we don't really care. What we care about is that particular person believes this is what God requires of them. So because of that, the free exercise clause applies, and we're going to be very, very careful with how he, tre he treads on this. We're, we're not going to say things like, that's not what the Bible says, or this isn't even what your denomination thinks. Thanks so much for being with us here on Tactics. We appreciate you watching, however you're watching. And if you're watching on YouTube, Facebook, be sure to give us a like and subscribe, because that is how we beat the algorithm, which, as always, is working against us. So we appreciate your support. My next guest is somebody who's been on the show very often, he tends to come here whenever we have anything dealing with constitutional law or religious liberty, or in this case, both. So we're going to go ahead without further ado and go to Matt Clark from the Foundation for Moral Law. Thanks for being with us, Matt. We appreciate you being on the program th this evening. Well, thank you, Caleb. It's uh, it, it's always an honor to be asked to come on the show with you and always have a good time talking about uh, stuff with you. So thanks for the invite. Yeah, well, I uh, I invite you as often as I can because I feel like the audience gets tired of hearing me talk about it. So well, they get uh, tired <laughs> of hearing me talk too. So, <laughs> so uh, this particular case that I've asked you to come into, for those of you who, who may not know, uh, it deals specifically with Andrew Cuomo and some of his restrictions that he's placed and a kind of Catholic diocese, if I'm not mistaken, is the one that filed this suit to try to say, well, you can't discriminate against churches and, and restrict them in this way when it came to the, the COVID-related restrictions. So if you could just give us some background and context on that case. Sure. So, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. This case was brought to the Supreme Court from uh, the Roman Catholic Diocese in Brooklyn, New York. And it involved uh, a question that hopefully, if we've been paying attention, has started to cross a lot of our minds right now. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, we all, we all acknowledge that COVID is a very real problem. And um, but, we're, you know, we have to start asking questions about, you know, how far is too far with the government, you know, issuing restrictions as they try to fight this. Mm -hmm. um, and in this case, in, in my opinion, this was one of the most egregious religious liberty violations as the states try to figure out how to deal mm -hmm. with COVID. Uh, there has been a, a wide range of how states have chosen to um, deal with uh, the, the coronavirus, and especially as it relates to churches. But yeah, Andrew Cuomo uh, in, in New York, some, his restrictions are some of the worst. Um, like a lot of other governors, he is making this stuff up as he goes along, uh, so we don't have a legislature getting together to even debate how to do this. It's one man calling the shots. Um, but right, and, and that's been one of my big criticisms, not only of the state of New York, but most of the states, including Alabama. Some yes. of the things that Governor Ivey's done, even the things that I agree with, I'm like, yeah, but she doesn't have the power to do that. And even if she did, I'd feel a lot more comfortable if the legislature was actually in on this at some level. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, governors have executive power, and, and I think there is a case to be made that, you know, when emergencies hit initially, maybe governors have some inherent power to be able to take immediate action to deal with an emergency, but sure. that can't go on for too long because otherwise you, you start crossing the line real fast into the governor making law, and that's mm -hmm. legislative and executive power combined, and that's just tyrannical. That's why we separate powers and why we're not okay with this. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's that, that's been a big problem in uh, New York, especially uh, Governor Cuomo has been very heavy handed. And by the time this came up to um, the Supreme Court uh, there, Cuomo had classified uh, different areas within the state and, and New York City in particular, uh, kind of according to a color coding system. If you found yourself in a red zone, then unless you were an essential business, you could have. Uh, no more than 10 people uh, in a place at one time. And th this is specifically talking about houses of worship, churches and synagogues and the right. like. Um, and, and, and personally, Matt, I really appreciate you explaining what to do once you're in a red zone because as an Auburn fan, you know, I'm not used to that. So, <laughs> Same here. Yeah. 
Um, Lord have uh, Lord have mercy on Auburn. I'm still, yeah. <laughs> War Eagle anyway, I'm, though. Yeah, War Eagle. <laughs> I was wearing an Auburn mask at work today, and, and one of my coworkers said, oh, come on, you know, th th this has got to be a joke, right? I'm like, no, this is called loyalty. I'm still sticking <laughs> with them even when they get whooped. Um, right, but but yeah, in this in this red zone, and he's he's offered these restrictions, and I believe the, the particular zone that was in question was one that was in an orange zone at the time, I think. There, there, there were a couple, as, as I remember it, because yeah, it mm -hmm. dealt with uh, Brooklyn, and th there was a companion case brought by a Jewish synagogue that uh, alleged pretty much the same claims. Right. And so some of these places were in red zones, others were orange. Orange isn't much better. You can have uh, up to 25, but then that's it. Um, but the problem was, in, in both of these cases, whether you're in red or orange, the governor made a long list of exceptions for businesses that he considered essential. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of secular businesses that could stay open, ranging from grocery stores down to laundromats um, and, and even liquor stores. Um, and, you know, some of the governors have been reasoning, we're going to have a major problem if uh, the alcoholics can't get their alcohol, you know. And I mean, on, on the one hand, okay, I, I, I get there may be something to that, especially if you're d dealing with domestic violence situation. But you know something is very wrong when the governor says, all right, liquor is essential, but church is not. The, yeah. It's <laughs> pretty bad. Um, that that that, yeah. that should be a big warning sign that maybe we've ski daddled off the right point at that time. I mean, that that was one of the big issues that was brought up by Gorsuch mm -hmm. uh, in his consenting opinion or consenting, <laughs> concurring opinion. <laughs> concurring, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, done too much Me Too stories lately, I guess. <laughs> uh, but in his concurring opinion, one of the things that that Gorsuch brings up, which I mean made sense, is that. It's not even necessarily that these restrictions on their face by themselves are unconstitutional or an overreach, even though I think you could certainly make the argument that they were. Yeah. He was saying, but you certainly can't put more restriction on the churches than you are a bike shop or a liquor store or a gym. Like, that's, that's not something you can do. Yeah, bingo. I, I was a big fan of Gorsuch's concurrence. He, he was not only saying the right things, but he was absolutely on fire and mm -hmm. pulling no punches as uh, as he wrote. So I thought he did a, a great job with that. Um, and, and I think my favorite thing was that he added just a little bit of sass. Yes. And it, it was Scalia-esque. <laughs> and as yes. much as I love Clarence Thomas, mm -hmm. not a lot of sass in his opinion. So it was nice to have, the in the absence of Scalia, have Gorsuch sort of fill that role. Oh, yeah, I, I agree completely. I mean, you know, I think Thomas is uh, the greatest justice we've had on the Supreme Court in well over 100 years. But in terms Agreed. of, yeah, the writing flair, yeah, that, that used to be Scalia's thing and now appears to be Gorsuch's uh, mm -hmm. thing, too. So his opinions are, are definitely entertaining to read. Um, but yeah, like, you you know, uh, the, the court as a whole, there, there were five justices. And, and th this goes to show the difference that Justice Barrett made. Um, because there were similar challenges that came up to the Supreme Court before Barrett was appointed. Mm -hmm. And um, the court uh, denied the application for uh, immediate relief five to four both times with uh, Chief Justice Roberts joining the liberals. Um, but you had Thomas and Gorsuch and Alito and Kavanaugh who all would have stepped in and stuck up for the churches. Well, so that, that block of four plus Barrett voted to... Um, stand up for the churches and, and give them the relief that they were asking for. Right. So um, procedurally, this 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 was not the way the court typically does things. They usually get a cert petition, they grant it, uh, they hear oral argument on both sides of the case, and then they, they make a final binding decision. Um, this was a request for an injunction while the petition was pending. So what that means is they're asking the court to step in and say, okay, as we're figuring out what to do, you have to hold off. You can't keep beating these churches up, all right? So that it's, it's a temporary order, but it's a good sign because for the court to give that, they have to conclude that you're likely to succeed on your claim. So uh, for right now, that is a very good sign for churches across America because it, you, what it signals is that we have five justices that are not going to be turning a blind eye to churches if, uh, if the government's either targeting them or, or treating them unequally with secular businesses, even in the midst of a pandemic. So mm -hmm. um, that, was, that, that was good. Uh, and and I really decision. think one of the important things about this opinion is that it, it helped in a different way, too, that I think a lot of people may not have thought about, because taking the, the judicial... I guess, rigmarole out of it and just looking at it from a human nature standpoint, for several months on end now, 
we have seen governors that have been acting like many dictators. Mm -hmm. And that's largely because so far nobody has stopped them or said them that they can't do something. And so if nothing else, even if you didn't necessarily agree with the opinion, which of course I did, but even if you didn't necessarily agree with the opinion, I think that most people would agree that it is at least a good thing for the governor to be reminded okay, there are some limitations to what I can do. Just because there's a virus doesn't mean I suddenly have unlimited power. And so that reminder could have sent out a signal to other governors, especially as several of them are considering going back into some sort of lockdown, mm -hmm. that maybe I should be a little bit more cautious about throwing restrictions on churches. Yeah, I agree completely. Um, I mean, you know, I, th I think you and I would both agree that the, one of the basic problems with human nature is we're not naturally good people. So if you right. send a message to anybody who has all power in his hands that he can get away with whatever he wants, he's going to abuse that before too long. Mm -hmm. And that has happened all across the country, definitely happening in New York, you know, very bad situation there. But um, but you're right. It, it, it is uh, a win for, for, for liberty across the board and for the rule of law for a court to finally step in and say, look, you, just because there's a pandemic doesn't mean that you can do whatever you want. You know, we're still a constitutional republic and not a dictatorship, even in the midst of a pandemic. Yeah, I think a great example of that is a story that I actually covered on my, my previous episode that I think is just a, it, it's such a microcosm of where we are as a country right now and how we value religion versus other secular things a California church actually reclassified itself as a strip club. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> I saw that. They're like, we, we got to start calling ourselves a strip club because if we, that way we'll get more rights and more liberty and have more freedom to worship if we do that. Which, I mean, it means that the strip clubs are being treated better by the government than the churches. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I can't remember if this is the same case or not, but I think in San Diego, there was a uh, a court case where uh, there, there was a strip club that brought a challenge to some right. Of these that, that's they why they did the redesignation okay. as as a result of that case. Okay, yeah, you you know there's something very wrong where you, mm -hmm. you know in the pandemic the strip clubs can meet but the churches can't. Um, I, I I loved uh, in John MacArthur's case. I, I loved how he opened the first sermon. After oh yeah, I love that clip. His, yeah, welcome to the Grace Community Church peaceful protest. <laughs> that was perfect. Not mostly peaceful, just peaceful. Yep. Yep. <laughs> but, you know, Cuomo argued, and, and this was sort of his rebuttal and, and something he made not just afterward, but during the case itself, he said, well, this case should be dropped because these restrictions aren't even on the churches anymore. We've actually scaled back the restrictions. Yes. And so because of that, this case is a, a moot point. Do you, do you agree with that? And if not, why? No, not at all. And, and so um, we're, you know, my firm is actually handling, um, you know, two cases right now where we're challenging COVID mm. restrictions. And one of them is sticking up for a, uh, a church that, you know, has some problems with some of the religious liberty restrictions. And, and this, right. in, in not only our cases, but um, just about every case that I've seen out there, this has been the government's go-to defense. And, and I can't really blame the government for arguing that because, frankly, if I was working in a attorney general's office, that would probably be the first point that I raise. Right. Um, the, the general rule is that um, for courts to make a, a decision and to issue an order, there has to be a live controversy. Mm -hmm. So meaning all right, there, there's actually a, a problem that is currently going on between two parties, and then the court has to be able to issue a ruling that's probably going to be able to resolve it. Right. It's an issue of standing. Bingo. Standing. Yep. So so the concept of mootness is is related very, very closely to standing. You know, the two kind of go to um, whether a court has Article Three powers to hear actual cases or controversies. The Constitution doesn't give it the ability to um, just render advisory opinions, but you right. know, it makes them solve real problems. So at the last minute, Cuomo backed out and lifted, you know, um, lifted his restrictions. And he said, all right, so it's moot. The problem is, um, you know, th this is not the court system's first time around the block. We have been seeing actions like this for well over a hundred years. And because of that, the courts have recognized an exception to the mootness doctrine, saying that if a matter is capable of repetition but evading review, then the court can go ahead and solve it. And, it, you know, to, to prove that, um, mm -hmm. you have to prove that... Uh, th that there's a very substantial likelihood that these people are going to find themselves in the exact same situation again. Um, right, and that's the thing that's so frustrating about mm -hmm. that defense is he's like, well, it's a moot point because they're not under this anymore. It's like, yeah, but you didn't even remove the law. The law's still there. They could presumably go back into an orange or a red status and then you would have it all over again. I could kind of see his point if the law was off the books, but it's mm -hmm. not. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and to be... Um, you know, it, if, if you let 
people like Cuomo get away with this, mm. then it really opens the door to even more shenanigans that you saw there. Um, in, in the case that my firm is handling out of Louisiana, I, I compiled, in our latest filing, I compiled a list of every order that our, our clients have been subject to from when this broke out in March up until now. And it was something like about 20-something orders. And um, if, if you want to be technical about it and if you want to change, how, you know, uh, if you want to count how the orders change um, ever so slightly, you know, it, it, our, our clients have been subject to about 20 different orders. And mm -hmm. so we told the court, like, all right, based on my math, if you divide that up, the, uh, the, the average length of one of these orders is about 33 days. So if you're going to challenge it, you're going to stick up for your constitutional rights. You can't file a complaint and let the judicial process play out because it's going to be over really, really quick. If you have to hit the reset button every time the order changes, you're never going to get a final decision at all. Mm -hmm. So that's why sometimes you have to hold the government's feet to the fire. Um, and there are some Supreme Court decisions saying that the government's voluntary uh, relinquishment of its wrongful conduct doesn't make a case moot, you know, because mm -hmm. sometimes you can sue the government and they realize, uh oh, we stepped in it. We're going to step back out. But then when the court's not looking, we're going to step right back in again. And I think that's, you know, right. that was a big complaint to what Cuomo was doing. Well, and that, that is the issue uh, with what Cuomo was doing exactly is because it seemed as though the, because right after this thing was filed is when he started changing the, the parameters of what qualifies as an orange zone or a red zone. And yes. so it seems as though that was a direct reaction to, and he was specifically trying to do that to make the, the argument, well, you can't change your policy to make the argument after the fact mm -hmm. that the previous uh, regulation that was in place was legally acceptable. Well, that, that's not how this works. Yep. Um, and so, I mean, it would be it would be almost like uh, in a football game if you get an offsides penalty called on you, you're like, well, we're not offsides now. <laughs> Well, well, yeah, but you were when we threw the flag. <laughs> That's yes. the problem. <laughs> that is an excellent analogy. As always, you're, you're able to come up with fantastic analogies. Well, thank you. Explain complicated legal stuff. So that was good. I appreciate that. So anyway, one other thing that I wanted to ask you, Matt, is could the government put some restrictions on a church? Because we've been very specific with this particular law in this particular case. I, I kind of want to go to to give the audience kind of a, a broader idea of what could happen and what would be acceptable. You know, we are in an unprecedented, at least for the last hundred years, pandemic. There, I mean, there are real concerns. Mm -hmm. and, and you and I have personally talked about that those kind of concerns before. So in an emergency situation like this, and if it was applied evenly, in other words, they're not specifically targeting churches, which seems to be what Cuomo was doing, what restrictions could be placed on churches and gatherings? So that is an excellent question. Um, in my capacity as a attorney for the Foundation for Moral Law, um, you know, we, we are taking the position that this is one of the few things that it, the First Amendment places absolutely off limits to the government. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if, if you try to go back and look at an originalist analysis, um, if you're trying to figure out what the founders would have done uh, during a pandemic, you're going to have a hard time finding, uh, you know, information. I mean, we haven't really been able to find, you know, much on that at all. Um, we go back and you look at the kind of things that they were fighting over back then. Um, it, they were really trying to avoid punishing people for going to church or the government dictating you can only go to certain churches but not others and, and, and even up until the present age re really up until covid hit um even even among liberals it, it was always presumed that no matter how far the free exercise clause extends in its application um the right to believe is absolute mm -hmm. and pretty much what you do in traditional church services that's probably off limit too um but the debate Beyond that, really came down to things like, okay, you know, can the Christian cake baker decline to um, turn down uh, making a custom cake on same-sex weddings? Right. But but for a very long time, it was presupposed that uh, the right to believe and the right to hold church services were absolutely off limits. Um, the court did not address that question in its uh, decision in um, of the, the the Roman Catholic diocese from last week, but they have they have left it open. What the court has recognized is that at a minimum, and those are the key words right there, at a minimum, um, the government can't treat churches worse than they treat you know secular counterparts. Right. Um, but anyway, we've you know in the litigation that we're pursuing, um, we have zeroed in on a few things from uh, from, from the founding era that we think are 
are, are applicable. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so number one, James Madison, when you look at his view, and he, he was the principal architect of the First Amendment. Right. He really viewed religious liberty as a jurisdictional matter. Um, he, mm -hmm. he said that religion or the duty that we owe to our creator in the manner of discharging it uh, can be exercised only by reason and conviction, not by force or violence. It is therefore mm -hmm. the duty uh, of every man to render the homage to his creator that he deems acceptable and not by, you know, how, how another decides it. So I started paraphrasing there at the end, but that's memorial only monstrance if you want to look it up. But as he goes on, he packs it out, and he really takes a social compact theory to its logical conclusion, saying, all right, if God gave rights to man and then man formed government, then how can government ever take away what belongs to God? It doesn't make any sense under this way of looking at it. Right, which is basically so, the premise of Locke, which is one of the big uh, progenitors of basically the entire philosophy that our, our nation and our laws were founded on. Bingo, bingo. So yeah, you've, you've got some stuff from Madison there. Thomas Jefferson said some civil, similar things in his Virginia Statute on Religious mm -hmm. Liberty. He thought that it was time for the government to step in when um, actions that are done in the name of religious exercise uh, become overt acts against um, you know, the, the, the public peace or good order. So I, I guess if you have, uh, for instance, um, let's take radical Islam, for example. Okay, yeah. You're, you're getting together and you're going on jihad and going after everybody and trying to kill people. Well, all right, that is definitely time for the government to step in and say, you can believe whatever you want, but you can't go around killing people. That's done. Um, or if you were talking about uh, something that would be a disruption to the peace, even if they aren't technically going out and killing people, just like inciting a rebellion or something like yes. that, that would be something that even if no one dies, that would still be something that's a problem because that's illegal in another capacity. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, and the, it, so in addition to what some of the founders have said, um, there's been, there have been some statements in some key Supreme Court opinions that we're also bringing up that we think work in our favor here. Mm -hmm. um, Employment Division versus Smith and Iverson versus Board of Education, those are cornerstone religious liberty cases, and a lot of religious conservatives don't like them because they were kind of bad decisions. But even as bad as they were, both had points where they recognized saying, regardless of what you can and can't do, you can't stop people from going to church. Um, Iverson, 1947 decision. This is the very first time that the Supreme Court invoked uh, Jefferson's wall of separation of church and state and sadly mm -hmm. took it out of context. And that's that's part of the reason why nowadays you see things like if you set up a Ten Commandments display at the county courthouse, you know, the ACLU comes after you. Um, however, for all its flaws, uh, the, the court at the beginning of the opinion uh, said, look, there, there's some pretty clear do's and don'ts here. And the Establishment Clause, one of, one of the things it's pretty clear on is that the government cannot force people to go to church or force them to stay away from it. So we zeroed in on that and said, right. that's what's going on here. Um, yeah, and, and that was kind of one of the points that I made, which is we have a First Amendment, and it clearly has freedom of religion in there. If that's not to protect you from a government saying you're not allowed to worship the way you want to, I don't know why we have it. Like, that's yeah. basically as far as it goes. Yeah. I mean, that would be almost like the equivalent of, in a first speech question, being like, but you're not allowed to say anything that we don't approve of. Like, that. that's yes. as far as it goes. There's no further to go from that. And Exactly. And and that's really where the, this issue comes in. And especially with, with Cuomo specifically, I mean, it seems as though, because I, I know you may not be aware of this. I know it's kind of a, a secret, but... There are actually mosques in New York. I, I know. How about that? <laughs> it's, it, they exist. I know. Yes. It's weird. People don't know this, but it, it's true. And uh, it seems like any time there is a Orthodox Jewish gathering or a gathering of Christians, Cuomo is all over that, and we have yet to hear of a case of them shutting down a mosque. Yeah, the, you know the, the, that's a good the, that's a good point, and, and that's something you know about the left that just makes me scratch my head. I, I think um, you probably saw this too, but if, if we back up five years and we go back to. Um, some of the lawsuits when they first started arising where uh, the left was coming after Christian bakers who didn't want to bake the cake for same-sex weddings. Right. Steven Crowder, who I, I think is just wonderful, he went undercover. I love this story. Yeah, he went undercover into Dearborn, Michigan, which has a very high Muslim population. And he, 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 he pretended to be a gay man who was asking them to bake a, a gay wedding cake. He comes up to this Muslim cake baker looking very effeminate. It's like, I want you to bake me a cake that says Adam and Steve forever. <laughs> right. like and the guy's like, no, I'm not doing that. And he caught about five of them on camera. 
And, and then, you know, when he was done with that, he said, now listen, I completely support the right of these Muslim cake bakers to not do this. But my whole sure. point is, where the heck is the outcry from the left? Because it's the exact same thing, except when the Muslims do it, you want to give them a pass. When the Christians do it, you want to crack down on them. And, and Cuomo's doing the same things in New York City. He's cracking down on Christians and Jews, but giving Muslims a pass to do whatever they want. Right, and, and not just Muslims, because of course that's more of one that we, it's sort of a it's sort of an argument from a lack of data, which I typically don't like to make, but it is kind of bizarre that in all yes. this time, there's not a single mosque in New York that's ever gathered anywhere. Like, that seems unlikely to me. Yeah. But on top of that, it's not even just those cases. We know for a fact that people like Cuomo and de Blasio and other big-name elected Democrat officials have actually gathered in giant gatherings for things like Black Lives Matter, yes. and it's okay when they do it. It's just not okay for you to get together with 11 people and take the Lord's Supper. That's that's way too dangerous. <laughs> uh, th th that is well said, Caleb. I agree completely. Um, in our in our case that we're handling out of Louisiana, so our, our client is a uh, the pastor of a Pentecostal church, and um, he you know he holds the belief that verses like Hebrews ten twenty five are to be taken uh, absolutely literally. You know, you so you know not forsaking the assembly of the brethren means all right. You got to show up in church in person, and so that that's you know th that's your angle that they've been fighting with. Um, right, so which this... by the way, I just want to interject here really quick before you finish your point. Um, I don't necessarily see it that way. I see the gathering as something that doesn't have to be in person per se. Uh, spiritual gathering is, is enough for me, but mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. He believes it. He has the right to do it. Bingo. You know, for what it's worth, uh, you know, I, I, I see it, you know, the same way. But when it comes to the First Amendment, the law really doesn't care one way or another which point is theologically correct. Right. What it, it tries to do is it, and it tries shouldn't. to, yeah, it tries to maximize individual liberty. And, and, and this is one area where I think um, even as badly as the court has the Supreme Court has messed up the free exercise clause. This is one thing where it's gotten it right, has been in cases where there have been, you know, um, beliefs that have come up that, you know, may be considered unorthodox, even within a particular person's denomination. The court has done a pretty good job of holding the line and saying, mm -hmm. um, we don't really care. What we care about is that particular person believes this is what God requires of them. So because of that, the free exercise clause applies, and we're going to be very, very careful with how he, tre he treads on this. We're, we're not going to say things like, that's not what the Bible says, or this isn't even what your denomination thinks. Uh, th th there is a line from a past Supreme Court case saying, the law knows no heresy. And I think on that regard, it's it, it's it's absolutely right, you know? Um, yeah, there, there was a story just recently about a church having a ceremony, like a celebration ceremony for a trans person, mm -hmm. uh, which I think yeah. is... A, an extremely high form of blasphemy, and every single one of the people that participated in that, they, they really need to search their soul because they're in danger of the hellfire, and there's just not a gentler way to put it. You're absolutely um, right. Celebrating something that God would absolutely condem uh, condemn as a sin, but they still have a right to do it. Like, I don't want government agents going in and stopping them from that. No matter how strongly I disagree with their stance... I still don't want their religious liberty trampled upon. Yeah, agreed. You know, so so a lot of this comes back to um, you know what Jesus talked about with render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Mm -hmm. And by the way, this is that that scripture is starting to be cited in in some of these COVID religious liberty cases where the courts have ruled you know in our favor. You know, they, they've right. they, they've pointed out that uh, um, you know the, the the government has some some limits on on what it can do and it seems that some of the courts even seem to be acknowledging the truth that god is real and that this might be a problem but we're going to leave it up to him to judge rather than letting um the mm. the, the government step in so yeah when jesus said that you know he, he was recognizing a couple of different spheres of jurisdiction there are some things in which the government does have the legitimate right to step in and tell you what to do but then there are some things that you owe solely to god and because of that regardless of whether you screwed up or whether you've gotten it right it's off limits to the government you leave that up to god alone to judge so I, I agree with you completely in, uh, you know, the case of, you know, the, the, the transgender uh, yeah, thing that, that you were talking about. I, I agree. I think that's that's heresy, that's sin. And I think God's going to deal with them for it, uh, both in this life and in the next, unless they repent. I really fear for them. Right. But the government doesn't have any business, uh, you know, stepping in and stopping that. So Right. I mean, churches uh, nowadays, especially in, in bluer states, have ceremonies all the time for gay weddings, which yeah, I believe is uh, just as much blasphemy as... as that is, but you know what? That's that's their right to do that if they want to do that. Agreed. Um, so I, I do kind of want to, because we haven't gotten nearly technical enough yet, uh, <laughs> I do want to get even more into the uh, the geek side of this on the procedural side. 
what does this say about the court going forward? Because I think th this being the first big religious liberty case that we've gotten since the new justice joined the court, what does this say about the makeup of the court and what we can expect in the future uh, on religious liberty cases and then, and then kind of as a whole as well? Okay. Uh, yeah, so that's, that, that's a good question. Um, so I think, uh, number one, what it says is that um, in religious liberty challenges to COVID-19 orders, um, if you have cases uh, that look like this case that has arisen out of New York, where there there is very there are very tight restrictions on religious liberty, and uh, the state is being very lenient with secular counterparts, um, the court is likely to step in and you know defend religious liberty, um, and and so they they are sending a message not only to Governor Cuomo but also to the entire country that you're not going to get away with it. Um, sadly, John Roberts dissented. And, you know, I've been trying to figure out Roberts. I, I just read a very lengthy biography on him, and even his closest friends refer to him as an enigma. And I think, I think that is a good way to put it, because sometimes it's very hard mm -hmm. to nail down exactly what's going on with him. I, I, I do think he's a conservative at heart, but I do think he also has a weakness in, in his role as a chief justice. He, he really is very sensitive to criticisms that the court is partisan, and so sometimes that can actually uh, bully him into. Uh, failing to step in when he should and stick up for constitutional rights. Mm -hmm. um, we saw that in the Obamacare case most specifically, and then the second Obamacare case where he reached even further to, to, to save Obamacare from, um, right. from, from an attack. And, and, and in, in, two, um, in the two religious liberty challenges involving COVID orders that came up before Barrett was confirmed, he was a swing vote and he, he sided with the liberals. Um, so I think a lot of people are concerned about that. A lot of conservatives have been very disappointed in John Roberts, but I think this this pretty solid five justice conservative majority that we have now, um, I think it sends a signal to the country, both in religious liberty cases and in other constitutional cases, that um, we can relax a little bit. We, we we don't have to hold our breath and wonder which side of the bed John Roberts is going to wake up on on a given day. I mean, we have five justices that seem to be very concerned about doing the right thing. See, I, I do have a question about that, too, and I'm not disagreeing. I'm just asking because sure. I want to get your, your take on it. Uh, when you say solid five conservative uh, majority, how solid is Kavanaugh? That's a good question. I, I think he is solid. I think he I think he's more solid than a lot of people perceive. So, I mean, I think he's clearly more solid than Roberts. I don't yes. think anybody would argue that at this point, but is it really solid and safe is, is kind of my question. So, the, you know, the, the, the technical lawyer answer is, well, it depends. You know, that, that frustrates <laughs> the heck out of everybody. And it understandably does. So. Um, so Kavanaugh, he, I think, I think a lot of us were kind of rightly concerned about him at the beginning. And mm. I think he's, he's not, he's definitely not as solid as Thomas. Um, but it's strange. In, in case, in certain cases, he's been more solid than Alito, and then in other yeah. cases, he's, he's been less. Um, Kavanaugh is a little bit more complicated. He, so, so by his own confession and by the confession of the law clerks that have worked for him, including Judge Walker, who mm -hmm. uh, wrote probably one of the strongest uh, religious liberty opinions on, on on a COVID challenge that the country has seen. Right. Um, they they have described. Uh, Kavanaugh as a textualist first. So, you know, unlike Scalia, he might not put as much emphasis on original intent, but he takes the words of the Constitution very, very seriously, and same things like statutes. Um, so if you've got to dig into what was going on inside the head of the authors, he may not be as keen on that, but as long as it's actually in the law itself, then he's going to more or less stay with that one? Yes, yes. So he, he starts with the text first, and then after he goes to the text, he looks at... Um, he looks at history, so he does look back, you know, around the founding era. I, I think he might not find their opinion as controlling as, a, like, Thomas or Scalia would. Okay. But he's still, you know, he's starting with the text. Then he goes to history as his primary outside source, so that's still good. Um, he looks at the structure of the Constitution as a whole to try to figure out, you know, when you take this particular provision together, you know, with everything, uh, you know, you want to make sure you get the context right. And I think up until that point, all of that is fine. And then finally, the last step in his analysis is what does precedent say? And that becomes problematic when precedent has gotten screwed up. Um, so at the end of the yeah. day, he, he walks through a problem in that order, and I think he puts, um, he puts the weight in the order of things that I just described him in. And so sometimes that leads him to make very, very good decisions. You know, even sometimes he, he lands to Alito's right. But I think what people are concerned about is sometimes um, 
it's like, I'll take the text of the Constitution, original intent, and precedent, which includes bad precedent, and I'll throw them in a blender and see what comes out. You know, so sometimes that means he comes out to, like, Alito's left. Sometimes Alito's right, depending on what's going on. So basically, if he's weighing those in terms of priority, he tends to be pretty good. If it happens to be a case where he just kind of like, all right, we're just going to consider all of those things and uh, shake up a bag and whichever one we happen to pull out, that's the one that we're going to go with this time. That's where he starts getting uh, a little bit less secure because he might draw out precedent as opposed to whatever else was in the bag. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, I've read some of his opinions. He, he thinks the judicial power clause of Article 3 does give the the, the the judiciary the power to make binding precedent and okay. I think that's why he feels this is constitutional duty to kind of adhere to precedent um, I, I commend him for trying to ask the fundamental question of you know how do I resolve this conflict between what the Constitution says and what the courts have held I mean, he's, he's trying to take a crack at it and it's something yeah. that judges don't do a lot nowadays um, I do think he gets it uh, I think he's a little off in that regard mm -hmm. um, because I, I tend to agree with Clarence Thomas that if there's a clear conflict between precedent and what the Constitution says, your oath is to the Constitution. So that's why, you know, you, mm. you just you go with what the Constitution says if you can't reconcile the two. You know, that's what I love about Justice Thomas. He basically says precedent is useless <laughs> yes. because he's like, because uh, the only time anyone brings it out is when they agree with it and they disregard it when they don't. So Bingo. it's basically worthless. Oh, yes. Agreed. It, it, you know, it, it, and the, the folks that rely on precedent to disregard the Constitution, the funny thing is, they say, well, this is about the rule of law. And, like, if it was about the rule of law, you would stop being so selective in which ones you choose. You know, right. you'd apply it even handily across the board. Well, um, and that, that becomes the issue with precedent as well, is that precedent becomes the, uh, the poison root of the, the poison tree, which yes. leads to poison fruit. Bingo. Um, and that's the problem, is that when all of a sudden that becomes your... Uh, your guiding compass, I guess, as opposed to the Constitution itself, then you wind up just error begetting more error, and it just continues on. So yes. the doctrine of precedent, I mean, in my opinion, should just be disregarded completely. But, you know, I, I know that there's a lot in the legal field that are different about that. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, this has been a good discussion, and if nothing else, this speaks well to what we can expect from the court in the future. It makes me feel a little bit better about some of the decisions we're going to have. You know, maybe we wind up with some procedural stuff when it comes to government regulation that I don't necessarily agree with the yeah. court on with this makeup. But it seems like on religious liberty, the court is going to be a much more reliable backstop than it has been in the past. Yes, I, I agree with you completely on that. Um, you know, even within the conservative block of justices, I... I tend to think that Thomas is really the only one that you can rely on to get it right uh, in you know just about every case. And, right. it, and obviously because he's human, he makes mistakes too sometimes, but it, sure. it's, it's pretty rare. Um, I really wish we had a court of six Justice Thomases. We, we don't. Uh, the, the rest... Oh, know, I would totally not. be in favor with that. I, yeah. In fact, since the Constitution gives no stipulation on how large the court has to be, I'm cool with just parsing it down to Thomas. <laughs> yes, fire the rest of them, make Thomas Chief Justice, and he, he right. is the Supreme Court. No, that's, no, that's no, no hate, you know, towards uh, a, ACB or Gorsuch, but, you know, I'm fine good. with just being Thomas. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Um, but but I will kidding. tell you what, it's... Uh, it, you know, th this court, though, I think it is, um, it, it, it's a completely standard deviation better than any court that we have seen in the past. You know, for, for a very long time, um, actually from probably about the time of the, the end of the Civil War up mm -hmm. until probably about Roe versus Wade, we had about 100 years of the courts losing their grounding in the text of the law, and they were kind of really making things up as they went. And and people didn't really wake up at you know at that until Roe versus Wade came along and you just and we found out oh my gosh like based on the words due process of law that means you can kill a baby in your first trimester maybe in the second probably not the third how in the world did you get there you know and then so since then conservatives have been making an effort to push it back. Um, well, I think but, it's kind of like and I, I I'm not trying to I'm not trying to justify us taking our eye off the ball in that sense. But it's kind of like when uh, a kid's not doing anything and so you take your eye off of them, it's not until they do something really bad, like break a lamp or something, <laughs> that you think, oh, wait a second, maybe we should be keeping an eye on that. You yes. know? And I think that that's what happened is it, it was this sort of slow degradation over that period of time. Uh, I blame a lot of that on Hugo Black from Alabama. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, it was so, sort of that slow walk, and then all of a sudden Roe v. Wade was like the lamp shattering in the background that everybody was like, wait, wait, wait a second. Yes, um, yes, agreed. But, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh, you're, well, I was going to say, probably from that, about that point up until, um, you know, up until now, uh, conservatives have been trying to get better justices back on the court, but you know, we, we took a step towards fixing that, but probably from about the Reagan years up until mm -hmm. now, what we had was a few reliable conservatives and then a couple of justices that were appointed by Republican presidents who, after they got there, we found out that they're pretty wishy-washy guys like, right. like O'Connor and Kennedy, um, yeah, especially those two. And then so it, it left us uh, with the situation where, you know, you got a very clear liberal block, a very clear conservative block, and then the swing votes in the middle. Um, I think for the first time, uh, definitely since Roe versus Wade and even probably far back before that, we now have a very solid majority of justices who I would describe as conservative. And, and I would even count Roberts in that equation. He is a conservative at heart. He, he's not like Kennedy where, you know... You're far he, more generous than I am. It, yeah. It, I, well, I've been saying we should just, especially <laughs> after this one, we should just start referring to Roberts as one of the liberal justices. Like, I, I'm <laughs> well, at that point right now. Yeah, I hear you. He, he, he is not jurisprudentially liberal, but where he buckles is, you know, with the criticism of... Uh, of the courts, and that, that's what can make. Well, see, compromise. but that that's what gets under my skin because I do have a lot of lawyer friends that that, that suggest this, and I, I have no reason to believe that they're incorrect. I think that they're probably right. It's like, well, it's only the big, like, sweeping cases that he winds up buckling on. I was like, well, yeah, but isn't that kind of the ones that you would wish that he would stand his ground on? Oh like, yeah, bingo, bingo. Uh, I'd be fine if on some of the procedural stuff he was less reliable if he actually just. When there's an obvious constitutional violation, says no, we're sticking with the Constitution. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. And, and to his I credit, mean, I mean, that's like having a quarterback that's really good at you know uh, those short passes, but when it comes time to actually make the game-winning play, he can't hit the broadside of a barn. Like I, I'd rather have the guy that can is reliable when you really need him. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think I think you're right, and I think um, I think Chief Justice Roberts in some misguided attempts to protect the court's image, he, he compromises. Now, what makes him different uh, than some of his liberal predecessors, especially guys like Anthony Kennedy, is he doesn't mm -hmm. just make stuff up out of thin air. All right, and that's, I mean, you know, Kennedy, Bridgefell versus Hodges. Um, you know, you could have dumped a box of alphabets on the table and had a higher chance of having a coherent legal opinion than what Kennedy wrote. Yeah, it was just that that's awful. fair. Um, it was applesauce. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Roberts isn't like that, but, you know, he'll, he'll look for excuses sometimes to go for, you know, the narrow way out. And he'll, he'll raise points that on their face are legitimate. But when you look a little deeper, it's like, you know, with all due respect, Mr. Chief Justice, that was kind of the coward's way out. You should have really put your foot down, held your ground, and stuck up for, you know, the party that was in the right, um, even if it would have given the court some criticism. Uh, so, so, I mean, I, I agree with you, Rob, Roberts is problematic, but, but, but even putting him aside, um, the remaining five, yeah, you know, th there are times where, um, with the exception of Thomas, I think the others can stumble. Well, maybe not Barrett. We, we have yet to see what she's going to do. Right, um, it's way too early to give an opinion one way or the other on her, I think. Yeah, but, but, but I will say, probably for the first time in a very long time, we have... At least five justices. Well, and, and, and I'm going to count Roberts because he agrees with this in theory. Who agree that it's the judiciary's job to say what the law is, not what the law should be. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that and, is that is important. Yes, and and that I mean, if if you can, you know, get the judiciary consistently um, applying that principle, then Roe versus Wade goes away. A Bridgefell versus Hodges goes away. A lot right. of these, a lot of these cases have been so problematic for for you know uh, for for the civil rights that we care about, a lot of those go away. So um, are, is the court perfect? No, heck, I mean, and, and do I wish some of them were a little more solid? Yes. But I'll tell you what, this is a better court than I have ever seen in you know my lifetime, and, and I think probably since at least uh, before the New Deal, it, it, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm messing my words up here, um, at least since the New Deal era. Uh, I think that was another big milestone is when um, FDR threatened to pack the court, you know, some of the justices started bending and, they, you know, right, which was so radical, his own Democrat-controlled Senate said, no, nah, we ain't doing that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but yeah, the, I'd say this is the best court that we've seen in a long time. I think we've got at least five that are going to be pretty good on sticking up for you know what's right and what the truth is um, and, and applying the law to the facts as it stands and, and, and being willing to go back and undo 
bad precedent when it actually conflicts with the Constitution. They, they might not do it as fast as I would like them to do. Uh, Thomas is the only one who, in my opinion, gets right to it and get right, gets right to the heart mm -hmm. of the matter. Um, but for the first time, we, we've got a majority that is actually willing to listen and willing to walk through the process of going there. So. Right, that, and that is incredibly important. And I would just say to uh, all of our listeners and audience, pray like you've never prayed that nothing happens to Justice Thomas yes. if we have Joe Biden in office, because that would be an unmitigated disaster. Now, obviously, we don't want anything bad to happen to any Supreme Court justice, regardless of how good or terrible they are. Agreed. But, man, having Joe Biden... And by that, I mean Kamala Harris, replace <laughs> Justice Thomas would just be an unmitigated disaster that could could hurt the country for a long, long time. And, oh, and he boy. is in his 80s. So um, we've got to, you know, keep an eye on that. But uh, Matt, thank you so much for being here with us. And, uh, you know, is there anything else you'd like to add before we take off here? Uh, just want to underscore those last words that you said about praying, um, well, especially for Justice Thomas, but... For the court as a whole, sure, um, yeah, because uh, you know we, we finally you know we have been fighting and, and the Republicans and conservatives have spent so much political capital on trying to fix the courts, and I think we're now finally there. So so number one, um, I you know as a fellow Christian, I'd say if you if you want to look deeper at it. Um, part of the reason why justice is stumbled is because ultimately it's a spiritual battle. Um, mm. You know, if, if I was Satan, I would be spending a lot of time trying to figure out how to manipulate the U.S. Supreme Court because they are the ones that unleashed, you know, the murder of over 60 million innocent babies on the entire country when the vast majority of states at the time had outlawed that practice. Um, and, and those nine justices, they're they're human. They have sinful natures just like ours. So. Um, I'm glad that we have justices that have the theory of constitutional interpretation right, but now they have to have the character you know, to do the right thing, including giving up the opportunity to take power when it's not theirs if they know they can get away with it. You know, mm -hmm. and that that is uh, it, it's 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 kind of like you know Frodo with Lord of the Rings when he finally gets to Mount Doom. He has right. the ring of power in his hand. He he has the opportunity to destroy it. We need justices who will cast that thing into the fire and not think twice about it. And oh my gosh, I just thought of a, the best gif. I'm gonna have that <laughs> that scene where he's holding it over the fires of Mount Doom and on the ring it says precedent. Yes, <laughs> like, yes. I've got to make that now. All right, Go Matt. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we always appreciate you coming by. Well, thank you, Caleb. Studies show that YouTube videos featuring attractive women get far more likes and subscriptions than ones that don't. This is especially true if she's exotic looking. Luckily, in the modern era, there's an easy way to work around this. You see, I identify as a very attractive Hispanic woman, so now you have to like this video and subscribe to my channel. Otherwise, you're just an evil, heartless Nazi that hates brave, liberated, beautiful Latina women like me. Checkmate, woke brigade.